Okay, it's been a while that I've been talking about uh, viruses. Uh, so let me talk to you today about polyvalent membrane interaction of SV40. This is work that started in my PhD in Ari Helenius lab. And then I couldn't let go of some of the ideas I, I still had and uh, distributed over the next couple of years. I've been uh, pursuing a number of ideas stemming from that. Um, and I'd like to talk to you about uh, what happened afterwards. And recently we have started working again together with uh, Tilo Stele, Laura Hartmann, Mario Schellehaas, um, and a couple of other guys, um, Charlotte Utrecht ha from Hamburg in the Virocarp uh, Forschergruppe Consortium. Um, and there we are now uh, continue investigating SV40 and other carbohydrate binding uh, virus surface interactions. So what that means, polyvalent membrane interaction of SV40 is that uh, this virus binds highly polyvalently like many viruses obviously, or most, um, to a lipid that is in the plasma membrane of cells. In this case, the lipid GM1, which has a carbohydrate moiety as its head, head group. And as you may know, it has a high sort of affinity for cholesterol. So it likes to uh, form domains inside of the membrane and that may be important for uh, uh, internalization and infection. And that's why it is uh, internalized in these very tight fitting membrane um, imaginations that are basically just membrane wrapped around the virus. So you may have seen uh, different electron microscopic images of your uh, favorite virus. Um, uh, SV40 is a polyoma virus. So it's a double-stranded uh, DNA virus from the family of polyoma viridae. The first one was found the mouse polyoma virus by Ludwig Gross and it's a tumor virus that has uh, on its outside the VP1 code protein that binds to uh, a GM1, and then it has VP2 and VP3, which are important for penetration of the ER membrane and escape of the DNA and uh, further processing. The DNA is wound around uh, uh, um, 25 histones uh, of about five kilo Dalton uh, genome. There's a number of human polyoma viruses that unfortunately some of which are um, uh, uh, cause of disease. However, uh, mostly in immunocompromised patients, so you will not see this a lot. Uh, during the AIDS pandemic, uh, this was, or during the hard times of the AIDS pandemic when there was no treatment, and um, people would uh, get really horrible diseases like fatal progressive multifocal local and so and so philopathy. <laughs> um, but uh, this is not seen much anymore. There's many, many more viruses discovered in the last years. This Merkel cell polyoma virus, one of the most prominent recent ones, which causes, causes a Merkel uh, skin cancer, um, and a number of more polyoma viruses in the last uh, years. One even here at the, or two of them discovered even at the uh, Robert Koch Institute here in Berlin. Um, uh, so this is what the Merkel cell polyoma virus looks like. And this is generally a pattern for most of these polyoma viruses. You have these VP1 icosahedral structure of about 40 to 50 nanometer uh, diameter. SV40 itself was discovered actually as an impurity uh, in cells that were used for polio vaccine production. So uh, everybody who got the polio uh, vaccine in the 70s uh, likely is SV40 positive because um, everybody was infected. So in the cell culture that was used to make the polio vaccine, um, there, these cells were infected with SV40. This is actually a virus that is endemic to the African green monkey. But uh, besides millions of people being infected with this virus and it being a tumor virus, there's no conclusive evidence for a role in carcinogenesis. So we have to we can relax about that. As I said, there's 25 histones that um, uh, wrap up the um, 5,000 kilobase genome that encodes for the T antigen, which immortalizes the cells, um, uh, some regulatory proteins, and of course, the VP1, VP2, VP3 uh, code proteins. SV40 is sort of the pet of uh, molecular biologists. It was the first sequence eukaryotic virus. Uh, it was uh, instrumental in the discovery of enhancers, alternative splicing, and the p53 tumor suppressor protein and the nuclear localization signal. So many 
breakthrough discoveries of molecular biology have been done with the polyomavirus uh, genome. This is what it looks like. It's 72 of these pentameric uh, protein subunits make out the, the uh, um, structure. This is from uh, um, the Harrison lab, the, uh, the uh, crystal structure. This is what it looks like in electron microscopy. And these pentamers, they bind very tightly to the uh, glycan moiety of the GM1 um, a glycolipid. You can see here really the protein almost makes touch with the hydrophobic core of the uh, membrane. Uh, the good thing is we can purify them, so we don't really like to work with uh, infectious material. We're not really virologists, I have to say, rather cell biologists. So we can just make the VP1 code protein, and it assembles wonderfully in these uh, uh, capsids. And you can then fluorescence label them, and you can have thousands of these particles bind very nicely um, to cells. And these VP1 proteins were given to us by Ariella Oppenheim uh, from Hebrew University. As I said, unlike most viruses would have these spike proteins that bind to transmembrane proteins of host cells and then are internalized by clathrin-mediated endocytosis. What happens to SV40 is that it binds to very tightly wrapped membrane uh, um, internal imaginations and then vesicles that leave hardly any space between the virus uh, and the membrane. And there's also not this electron dense clathrin material here. So that was very puzzling when people have first been observing this virus. And since now uh, we know that it is indeed a clathrin independent endocytic mechanism. And when Alicia Smith, the postdoc in the lab uh, for of Ari Helenius added lots of murine polyoma viruses to cells, so she could find that these form these very tight fitting long tubular structures in which one virus after the other um, were assembled. And then together with Winfried Römer and Ludger Johannes at the Institut Curie, we could show that these, these tubes are indeed surface connected and they can go throughout the entire cell, as you can see here by co-staining with the FM dye added uh, uh, exogenously to the cell culture medium. So it's SV40 binds to membranes and then makes these tubes. Um, we then thought, well, uh, SV40 is considered to enter cells uh, via lipid mediated endocytosis. And at the time, lipid rafts were a big thing. And I talked to Howard Reisman about this, who's of course a big expert in lipid metabolism. And he was not so convinced of the whole lipid raft story and told me, well, you know, I think the right question hasn't really been asked about these lipid rafts. And I was thinking, well, what is the question about lipid rafts? And uh, it seemed to me that the key question would be that there are physical chemical properties of lipids that have to control cellular functions. And I thought I had here a system at hand where I could directly test the physical chemical properties of lipids or the structure of a lipid to ask if it control, can control a fundamentally important process such as viral infection. So I went about and bought Bodapai GM1. So this is a GM1 molecule where one of the side chain is, is taken off and a dye is put back to it. Uh, and I could find that these cells were not infected anymore when they had only Bodapai GM1. So that was very exciting to me, but of course everybody said, well, Bodapai, that's not really a good lipid. You wanna have a real lipid. So we teamed up with uh, Tan Fezi and Günther Schwarzman who synthesized on one hand, a GM1 in which just one acyl chain is shortened. So it has one only eight carbon chain acyl chain of the two acyl chains of the receptor lipid and a number of phospholipids that have the GM1 carbohydrate on top. Okay. In this way, we could control very tightly the physical chemical properties. So the structure of the uh, lipid to investigate if there's a structure function relationship for lipids in the infection of SV40. And you can see this is the native uh, GM1 and uh, this is how it comes in most uh, cells with the two different acyl chains. Uh, we can cut off the shorter one and just make it to C8. And then we can have two unsaturated C12, uh, two saturated C12, two saturated C16. Then we have the um, unsaturated C18 and then saturated C18 
to add them back into cells. So we made use of cells that do not have any GM1 by themselves. We then add the lipids so that it becomes incorporated into the plasma membrane. We then add SV40 and we look for T antigen expression in the nucleus, uh, which is a marker for infection, obviously. And then we count infected cells. And what we could find is that depending on the side chain, we get more or less infection. So this is the wild type level of infection. Then if we cut off one acyl chain only to half, we get barely any infection. And the same holds true if we only have short acyl chains. However, we could rescue uh, infection reproducibly with uh, fairly long saturated acyl chains or even unsaturated long acyl chains. So it seems that indeed there is a structure of function relationship for lipids in the endocytosis of SV40. Um, <clears throat> um, we then wanted to investigate how this happens. And to that extent, uh, we used um, giant unilamella vesicles. So these are large globular structures made of a single membrane bilayer to which we add a fluorescent dye, which you can see here in green and labeled fluorescent virus. And this you can see here. And you can see that if we have the native GM1 in there, the VLPs, they can make very nice tubules. However, this is not possible if we have the short acyl chain or the other short acyl chain GM1 in there. But if we have the long acyl chain GM1s in there, there's no problem. The virus can bind to and deform these membranes. So somehow the virus can exert its force on the membrane and push itself into the membrane in dependence on the lipid acyl chain. Um, at the same time, we also have a phase preference for the virus uh, for when it binds to the long acyl chain lipid that is different from the um, so-called uh, disordered phase. So we have here the disordered phase in green, the ordered phase with the virus in it in red. If we have the short acyl chain, both virus and lipid uh, go to the disordered phase. Okay. Um, as Fred Maxfield said uh, so wonderfully, the properties of a membrane bilayer arise from the collective effects of a large number of weak non-covalent interactions, right? So because we have all these weak uh, lateral interactions between all these lipids, so weak non-covalent interactions, um, some lipids like to reside for a little bit longer with some lipids than others, right? So sphingolipids lipids like to be together with cholesterol, maybe a nanosecond more than with other lipids, right? So usually at uh, uh, the temperature that organisms live, this doesn't make a difference because uh, um, the KBT is higher than, than, than energy. However, if you bring all these structures together by a virus, so if you now bind many, many, many of these lipids together, we hypothesize this could be some kind of a condensation core for the formation of a lipid cholesterol cluster um, or such a, a membrane domain. Uh, indeed, this is something that can be observed in vitro. So I don't know if I can now. Hmm. Maybe I, I do have to go back to my pointing thing. Yeah, okay. So this is something I got from the Dan Fletcher's lab. So here you can see a phase separated vesicle. When we increase temperature, it mixes, it becomes homogenous, but then if we decrease temperature, the vesicle unmixes, okay? So domain formation, of course, depends on uh, the temperature. So we have demixing or unmixing of the different components. So unmixed, we increase temperature, it mixes. We have homogenous mixture like we usually have in, in cell membranes as well. And then we decrease the temperature and we spontaneously unmix. Now this unmixing, we obviously don't see in membranes normally, but um, uh, in uh, uh, Jerry Feigenson's lab and this uh, seminal paper, uh, Greg Hammond used uh, um, cholera toxin, which like SV40 binds to GM1 to show that you could have a homogeneously distributed um, um, mixed vesicle and you add cholera toxin, you cluster GM1 molecules and you induce separation into the different phases. So by bringing many of these lipids with similar um, properties together, you can uh, generate a condensation core that then leads to large-scale uh, phase separation. 
Now, SV40, interestingly, has, if you look from the bottom at one of these VP1 pentamers, it has these three nanometer spaced binding sites to GM1, okay? Now that's not a lot. There's only like five lipids in between every GM1 molecule. Okay. So we have them in very close spacing. And interestingly, the spacing is exactly the same in corotoxin. Here also we have five binding sites with exactly five, uh, with exactly three, 30 nanometer or 31 angstrom distance between these binding sites. So there seemed to be a uh, convergent evolution towards exploiting a biophysical mechanism of membrane. Um, deformation. To see whether our vesicles also become separated, we added uh, VLPs to um, uh, um, GM1 containing uh, vesicles, and we could find that on these vesicles, the viruses would cluster before they form these tubules, okay? So you have these little dots, domains, and if you go over the radius of this GOV, you can see that you have these clusters forming. Okay, so that means we have unmixing of the virus um, when we add it to GM1 on native, uh, native GM1 on GOVs. However, if we have the CHGM1, the short acyl chain, we cannot support unmixing and we don't see any clusters. We have relatively homogeneous uh, uh, staining. So it seems that we have a step where we um, cluster GM1, this leads to lateral phase separation where all the viruses come together and then one by one, they can then deform the membrane and fit into this tube that's formed inside the cell. And we then ask whether these tubes that we saw in cells could also be formed by uh, the cholera toxin with a similar organization of binding sites or a GM1 antibody. And we could indeed find that SV40 pentamers, just like the antiavirion can make tubes and the pentameric cholotoxin, which has the same spacing of binding sites as the pentameric, can also make tubes, but antibodies cannot. And the same holds true for um, um, these GOVs. So the full, full virion catalyzes membrane invagination a little faster than the penton or the cholotoxin, which makes sense because, um, of course, it has many more binding sites and can push its force much stronger onto the membrane. And only the full virion can invaginate a stiff ordered phase GUVs, which the pentons cannot because they cannot exert the same level of force on GUVs. Um, so this was very exciting to us to be able to show a uh, um, structure function relationship for lipids in a viral endocytosis and infection. But a few questions remain to us. So how many receptors does the SV40 really bind to? How much does it need to stick to the cell? And do either concentration of GM1 or the mobility of GM1 in the membrane influence binding to SV40? And to investigate that, um, we decided to generate a computer model. So I gathered uh, some data. So I looked at the diffusion of single lipids. So you can see this is single GM1 molecules. I apologize that the video is quite slow. So these are single GM1 lipids diffusing about in a supported membrane bilayer. So we could gather the diffusion coefficient of the lipid, how fast the lipid moves about in the plane of the membrane. Uh, I measured the, uh, the diffusion coefficient of the virus in solution. So how the virus itself wiggles around when it approaches the membrane. And then we measured the affinity, the binding of the virus to membranes at different GM1 concentrations and found very high affinity obviously uh, for the virus, but we could vary concentration um, in the membrane to ask when you would bind. So we then modeled uh, the SV40 GM1 interaction, this Olivia Sklarchit did with Ivo Spalzerini, uh, who was a postdoc at the time at ETH Zurich. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is the model. We have a three nanometer diameter of the virus. You can see here the pentameric organization of binding sites on the surface of the virus. We know something about how fast the virus moves. We know something about the individual interaction, how, what the affinity is with the individual lipid. We know something about the movement of the lipid um, and we know about the concentration of GM1 in the membrane, which goes from one to 100 to one to uh, 12,500. And then uh, this is the computational model uh, we, we generated. So 
uh, we could then watch at different concentrations of <clears throat> um, GM1 in the membrane bilayer, how the viruses would interact. And you can see three different concentrations um, for which the virus interacts with the membrane. So at 0.1 mole percent, you can see that it binds, it comes off again, and then it binds again. And it has a number of receptors up to like 10, and then it goes down again, and then it collects more receptors and it moves about a little bit. At 0.3%, it just stays put to the membrane, but it can wiggle a little bit and it increases steadily its number of receptors and it just sort of drifts around in the membrane. And at one mole percent, it just drops and gathers a high amount of receptors. And of course it's sterically hindered. So the receptors, they can bind to the bottom of the virus, but the top of the virus is too far away to um, make connections to um, the receptors. And that's why we have a maximum of about 40 it's like eight pentamers, right? And it just stays put. So that's very nice because we could um, uh, successfully model many aspects of what we observed in our experiments. So you can see the QCMD, which is quartz crystal microbalance binding assays of SV40. And this is the simulation. And interestingly, as I would have hoped, we had some sort of biphasic interaction. So we have low concentration of virus of, of receptor. We just get a little bit of binding and then there's a like a phasic transition where suddenly all the viruses bind. And as you can see here with the receptor concentration um, of about 0.2%, it starts to bind very strongly. And here you can see how long it takes to bind. Here it really needs to interact with the membrane a bit and these guys just drop down. And the mean number of receptors uh, uh, goes up, of course, with um, uh, receptor concentration. If you look now more closely at um, low receptor concentrations, which are more interesting um, for us, uh, we could see um, that we have a steady increase for receptors that are mean bound to the virus uh, of about four to five. Okay, and this is what we need to form a stable bond, as our, as our model showed. But what we did then is we um, did not allow our receptors to move anymore. So we either reduced the diffusivity of the receptor to about 0.1 or a tenth of what we measured, um, or we removed any mobility of the virion. And what you could see is that high receptor concentration, it didn't really matter so much because there's so many receptors around, wherever the virus binds, it finds enough receptors to, to bind to it. However, at low concentrations, we could see a very striking effect. So at these concentrations here, up to 0 0.05, almost 0 0.1 <clears throat> um, uh, per mole percent, where we can, uh, we can hardly see any binding with immobile uh, uh, receptors. So there's no receptors bound at this case, but there's about five, per, five receptors bound per virion in 5% of virions at this concentration. Um, so that means that uh, because there's so few receptors in the time it takes to form the bond, um, the, the bond breaks again and the virus comes off again. So usually what would happen is another receptor would come by by diffusion and then strengthen the bond, increasing the time. And then the third one would come by by diffusion and then you have an even stronger bond. And this way the virus would gather sufficient number of uh, receptors to actually stay stuck to the membrane because the individual action interaction is in the uh, millimolar range, okay? However, if we abolish a diffusion, it can only bind to the one it sticks to, no other receptors can come by, and then it will just come off again and we cannot have stable binding. So at the concentrations as we find them in cells, which is 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 mole percent, which is kind of this area here, we only have productive binding and subsequent infection of virions because at uh, um, <clears throat> physiological temperature, receptors move around in the plane of the membrane and thereby allow for uh, binding of the virus. This is what it looks like. You have the uh, bottom of the virus as you can see it here and uh, every binding site here is a hole if it's not occupied and it's a spot when it's occupied. And you can see that 
nothing happens at zero milliseconds, but at 0.1 millisecond, the first contact is made here. Then a second and a third contact are being made. Uh, then here you can have a fourth contact made. Then here it's the number of more contacts and you can see that the virus is rolling over the membrane, right? So here with the circled pentamers, they are first at the very side of the virus, but that uh, then some bonds are made at the side the virus turns over to the middle and then the bonds at the side, they are long broken around here. So the virus approaches the membrane, touches down and then at the front makes new uh, uh, connections and in the back breaks its connection. So it's rolling over the membrane. At higher concentrations on the other side, you can see here it touches down. It immediately makes with several pentamers, a lot of connections. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. 17 already, oh, let's put it here. <laughs> 17, it took a long time, I didn't give that talk. 17 receptors bound here and quickly it's 40 uh, of them. So you can see that now the virus just drops down and just stays immediately put. So this was very exciting for us because we could also see it in the trajectory of the virion. So at 0.1 mole percent, when it only binds to a few virions, you can see the color codes for how many virions are bound. Um, it binds to several and then it keeps moving. Oh, sorry, sorry, now here it touches down, it approaches the membrane, but it doesn't form a bond. So it flies off again, it approaches the membrane again. Then it forms a couple of bonds, a couple of more bonds diffuses around, makes and loses connections until it later here forms a fairly stable bond with 10 to 15 um, receptors bound. Here it touches, makes more bonds, more bonds, wiggles a little, and then it just can sort of drift. And at one mole percent, it basically drops down and very quickly has um, many, many uh, interactions. And that is because it's both moving around and receptors are moving around and they're just gathered under the virion extremely quickly if you have high uh, concentrations of receptor. So from this, we could learn that SV40 needs indeed at least four receptors to form a stable bond, that the lateral mobility of GM1 is important for the formation of stable bonds and concentrations as they are found in real cells. And the amount of receptors bound determines also the motion of the virion of the membrane. So this was very exciting for us, but what is with the stepping rolling behavior? Is that really what happens? And this is something I had been thinking about in my PhD. I mean, not a lot, but I thought it was interesting to figure out what actually happens, right? Does the virus just slide or does it roll on the membrane? Now, how the hell are you gonna measure that? Are you gonna ask? And that's, uh, I got a lot at the time. So I discussed with many, many people I met at meetings and so on about how to possibly do this. So I thought I maybe put a fluorophore and add it with both ends so that it's stiff and then measure anisotropy as the virus drifts and rolls. But I happened to uh, work on weekends while I was in my postdoc, I would come back to, to France, uh, to, to Switzerland and work in the lab of Fahid Sanakdar. Uh, with my buddy, uh, Philip Kukura, uh, who's now at, at Oxford. And uh, they were at the time developing a technique that allowed to detect scattering signal from a virus. This is now a commercial solution with which you can measure mass um, of molecules. So you can basically detect proteins just from scattered light. Um, and what we did was we didn't only detect the virus with this scattered light technique, but we also put a quantum dot on it which is fluorescent, so we could detect the virus through the scatter signal and the fluorescence through the, from the quantum dot as well, okay? So we have two signals, um, one uh, <coughs> scatter signal, and this is what you get from one virion, and also a fluorescent signal, okay? This is what it looks like. So you could have here three virions. You can see all of them in the scatter signal, but only two of them, this one and this one, have a quantum dot. So you can also see them in the fluorescence signal. And the localization error is about two nanometer for the virus. And it's about three to four nanometer for the fluorescence signal, okay? And because the quantum dot has a non-zero size, we assume it can only be above the equator. So now you get 
By this measurement, you get the center of mass of the entire virion. And by this measurement, the fluorescence measurement, you detect the signal that's emitted from the quantum dot. Now, the distance between these two signals can tell you something about how the thing is moving. Okay? If the quantum dot is up here, if we move like this, the distance between the fluorescence and the scatter signal should go, grow apart. Right? And to see if that is possible, we, of course, made a number of uh, um, uh, controls. But let's, first, let's look here at the motion of the vir vir virus and the quantum dot at the same time. See that wiggling around here. I was really happy when I saw this video for the first time, and I still enjoy it a lot, I have to say. And what happens here is that the virus and the fluorescence signal move together. Okay. Now, first, we did this with a fixed virion. So we put the virion with the quantum dot on the glass, and then we moved around um, the virion and the glass, right? And we could show that it's a consistent distance. We could really measure the distance from the virion to the QD, and we could move it around <clears throat> and the distance between um, the, the quantum dot and the particle would be constant, right? However, if it would move about, the distance would constantly change, okay? And if a single bead only moves, it only emits in fluorescence, so it only measures its own position. So we could show that there's indeed a difference. So here we can see now a virion on a 0.1 nanomol, uh, nanomol, or 0 0.1 molar GM1 uh, surface. And you can see here, this is for example, one distance here. You can see this is the distance between the virion and the quantum dot attached to it. And clearly at some other points, the distance is much higher, okay? And what happens here is that the virus is indeed rolling about on the surface of this membrane which is uh, shown here in this movie again. And you can see how the quantum dot and the virus is moving uh, and rolling about on the surface um, as we observe the relative distance of the particle and the quantum dot. <clears throat> so here you can see the relative position of virus and quantum dot uh, uh, is relatively constant. And it seems here really that we can see a switch between two different states where it's localized like this and localized like this. And interestingly, the distance and the angle between these two states that we could observe are consistent with the virus basically dipping from sitting on one panton versus sitting on the next panton. Okay. So we could see now nanoscopic stepping sizes um, at high uh, concentrations where the virus didn't really move, but only dip back and forth between these two positions. Um, oops, sorry. <clears throat> OK, so um, uh, this is what I uh, wanted to share with you. So we, we are interested in the surface interaction of the SV40 virus. So I, I show, showed you that uh, SV40 binds to GM1. It can then very quickly assemble more than one uh, GM1 receptor under itself. Uh, by a surface diffusion and because of the receptor diffuses as well. So it collects a number of receptors. The number of receptors it collects leads to co-recruitment of other lipids that then form some form of membrane domain. Um, and as more receptors are gathered, these receptors want to stick to the virus and that basically forces the membrane to invaginate and engulf uh, the virion and then by so far not completely understood mechanisms, this is abscised and then further uh, sent down into the cell uh, for infection. And this uh, depends on <clears throat> the acyl chain structure of the glycolipid receptor of uh, GM1. So we propose here a lipid binding induced invagination mediated mechanism uh, for membrane deformation that is strikingly different from actin active deformation of the membrane by induced uh, endocytosis or ligand-mediated endocytosis um, as we know it from uh, clathrin or, or other uh, carriers. And since this valency is somehow the, on this organization is shared not only by SV40, but also by the cholerotoxin subunit 
by the heat labile enterotoxin beta subunit. This is what the toxin from EHEC, where a couple of people died from a couple of years ago. And also the shiga toxin, shiga-like toxin, <clears throat> has many lipid binding sites organized in this very tight pattern. We believe that this may be a global mechanism that pathogens uh, exploit to understand what is going on um, in infection of these in internalization and toxicity mechanism and infection of these pathogens. And for comparison, this is an IgG molecule. The binding sites are spaced much further apart uh, and they are also flexible. So we have a much less stiff organization of the uh, lipids um, to impose their strength uh, onto the membrane. So <clears throat> uh, what we uh, remain to be interested in right now is we want to sh uh, find out how this relates to intracellular trafficking. And this is some work that is now ongoing uh, in the lab. We are now part of the viral carb consortium with uh, Dilo Stele and others. And here we want to investigate how um, the structure of the ligand controls um, internalization. And if this is a general mechanism for um, polyvalent lipid binding uh, viruses. So um, from the literature, we know that individual ganglizides, when they become endocytose, they quickly become recycled back to the plasma membrane, just as bulk uh, membrane material. On the other hand, chorotoxin, when it uh, becomes internalized, uh, goes from the endosome to the a Golgi apparatus. And after two hours, you have very striking Golgi enrichment of chorotoxin inside cells. However, from polyoma viruses, SV40, we know that it bypasses the Golgi and goes via the endolysosome to the endoplasmatic reticulum. And we now want to ask um, what it is that makes up for this difference since both bind to the same uh, glycolipid. And if indeed it's the difference between the planar organization at the core of the chorotoxin and the globular organization of the SV40 virion um, that controls uh, this sorting inside of the cell. So <clears throat> the first step in doing this is investigating uh, the different types of lipid binding viruses to see if they share uh, this common interaction. And Raluca Groza, a PhD student uh, in the uh, laboratory, has been starting investigating SV40, the murine polyoma virus, and Merkel cell polyoma virus. And we could indeed show that SV40 and the murine polyoma virus are capable of deforming membranes very potently. Um, with Merkel cell polyoma virus, uh, we don't find effective binding to the receptors they are supposed to bind to, unfortunately, yet. With the JC virus, we do see some binding, but so far, um, no membrane deformation. When it binds to GD1, um, uh, the BK virus, um, we also don't get productively bound to uh, ganglioside and JC virus, not to GT1B. Um, on the other hand, in cells, we could show that SV40 binds like pearls on a string in these wonderful uh, tubules here. And this seems to hold true as well for uh, the murine polyoma virus and maybe even for the uh, Merkel cell virus. But for JC and BK, uh, we are not so sure if these are indeed surface connected tubules uh, yet. And this is work that has been pushed forward by uh, Raluca Groza and hopefully uh, in about a year's time or so, uh, she will be able to talk to you more about uh, her project. She asked me not to uh, spill the beans today uh, here. And uh, with that, I have to thank a lot of uh, collaborators uh, from uh, that time. So Ari Helenius in whose work this, this work has been done. Uh, and Alicia Smith, the postdoc I was working with, Ludger and Winfried did all the SHIGA work and the GOVs, uh, as did Petra Schwill and Kirsten Bakia. With Philip Kukura and Vahid Sandukdar, we did the measurements of the rotating and rolling virus. Günter Schwarzman and Ten Fezi uh, and Meng Chai made lipids for us. Jürgen Kartenbeck did EM, and Ariel Oppenheim gave us uh, uh, VLPs. Because uh, um, Olivia introduced me so nicely as an expert in uh, microscopy. I want to share a, a little something uh, with you you might find interesting. So this is a absolutely spectacular novel microscopy technique called expansion microscopy we've been working on as well. So this has uh, been first published by Ed Boyden who in invented it in 2015, where he basically said, well, what we do is we make a gel inside a cell, then we cross-link all the proteins in the cell to this gel, then we digest the whole cell into soup, uh, 
And then what we do is we put the gel into distilled water. And what it will do is exactly what a diaper does. If liquid comes into contact with it, it will just expand. And what we can do then is we can detect the little protein snippets that are linked to the gel and to microscopy. And because this expansion was isotropic, we just see the very same picture of the cell as before, only that it's much bigger. Now, when I read this first, I thought this is absolutely insane. It cannot work. But um, I had a brave student who decided to try it and uh, we could combine it then with stent microscopy. And I can tell you, it does work shockingly. So you can see a confocal image of a cell. This would be uh, the corresponding stead super resolution image. So it works obviously much better than confocal microscopy. But if you expand yourself and then do stead microscopy, you can see actually really wonderfully resolved microtubules. And you can even see this famous railroad track two lines microtubule staining, which means that because of so many antibodies binding all around the microtubules, you only see the outside of the two microtubules. Okay, it's like a hollow tube. Um, that's what you can actually detect. So this is in 2D and in 3D, you can also have much nicer resolved microtubules here inside the cell compared to confocal and stent microscopy. So we can really push uh, the resolution um, at a factor of 10 by combining expansion and stent microscopy. You can see an entire cell that we expanded. And you can see from the different color that within my one micrometer, we can see several microtubules that are easily separated. Here you can see the individual microtubules. Um, a confocal a volume would be about this, right? I can tell you. So all of these would be together one blob in a confocal microscope. Um, now we can very nicely separate individual microtubules in 3D in an entire cell. Um, a little drawback, uh, this image you can see here is a stack of an entire cell. It took about eight hours to take on the uh, STED microscope. So you need somebody with a, a, a generous um, STED owner or a lot of money for the facility if you wanna do this. But the result are spectacular, super resolved images. And with that, I wanna close and uh, thank uh, my lab uh, and uh, a number of funding uh, bodies, number of SFBs and, and Vorschelgruppe we're in and our uh, most uh, 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 investigated protein is the septins. Here you can see a super resolution microscopy image of a cell in which we zoom in on a septin cytoskeletal filament and we are we can here resolve the individual subunits in this uh, cytoskeletal polymer uh, to count uh, the subunits. We work up here in the um, first floor of the Hahn Meitnerbau in the beautiful Dahlem. This is the former um, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for uh, Chemistry, where Otto Hahn uh, discovered the, the split the first atom uh, down here somewhere. Um, um, yeah. Uh, with that, I'm done and uh, I'm open for questions. Thank you.